Good evening, everyone, and thank you for tuning in and joining us tonight. My name is Steve Jamroz. I'm the Director of Marketing here at DAN. Tonight, we're here with my colleague, Kat Harris. We're going to welcome you to the March edition of the 2022 webinar series. For over a year now, we've been getting together each month to discuss a new dive safety topic to keep you safer and better prepared. If you're tuning in for the first time tonight, our webinars will last about 30 to 45 minutes and we'll follow that up with a question and answer session at the end. If you're viewing this presentation over at the event page at dan.org, please keep in mind you won't be able to ask questions there. You'll have to jump over to Dan's YouTube channel, post your questions in the chat, and we'll get to those at the end. Also, keep in mind this webinar will be recorded, so if you come in late tonight, you have to leave early, you'll be able to watch the entire webinar over on Dan's YouTube channel at your own schedule. Tonight's presentation features an update on Dan's injury monitoring program. Our presenter is Kat Harris. Thanks for being with me tonight. She's one of our research associates here at Dan, and her primary role is to assist with the various ongoing studies that are being conducted in the Dan Research Department. She's heavily involved in our fatality and injury monitoring efforts. She's an avid diver. She's got a strong interest in scientific diving. She's also an open water scuba instructor, so she's very knowledgeable, which is great to have someone here like that tonight. But before we begin, on behalf of the entire Dan team here, we'd just like to thank you for supporting Dan. It's through your membership, your support of our DIVAX insurance programs, travel insurance, professional liability, that we're able to continue doing what we do to keep bringing you educational content to keep you safer and better prepared and informed for safe diving. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Kat and we'll get right into the presentation. Awesome. Thanks, Steve. So tonight we're going to be giving you an update on Dan's injury monitoring efforts. We're gonna start by highlighting some of the numbers of fatality monitoring from 2019, 2020, and 2021. And then we'll go into how we collect our reports, specifically the Diving Incident Reporting System, or DERS. And then finally, we'll talk about a few cases that I've selected to discuss and key considerations to take away from that. So first off, in 2019, Dan, uh, tallied up 186 total fatalities that were reported to us here at Dan. And we break these down in a number of different ways. So we have breath hold diving, recreational, non-recreational, and then we do break them down by location and analyze data that way. In 2020, you notice a drop in fatal accidents to 115 total reported. That's possibly due to the pandemic and not a lot of divers getting back out there. Um, but we have broken them down and they're currently being reviewed by our team. And then in 2021, we have a total of 166 fatalities and 28 non-fatal accidents that have been reported to Dan. Those have not been uh, organized yet, so we're still in the data analysis phase for 2021 and 2022 has kicked off, came out swinging. So we've got a lot of work to do on our injury monitoring. So now we're gonna talk about our diving incident reporting system. If you guys remember from the November webinar that myself and Dr. Frauke Tillmans hosted, uh, we talked about this a little bit more in depth, but I wanted to remind you guys that we have this resource here and it's mainly for you guys to report your incidents to us here at Dan without any repercussions. It's totally anonymous, it's voluntary and confidential. What can be reported in DERS? Well, anything from mishaps, close calls, near misses, accidents, fatalities, uh, challenging dives, successful dives, if you wanna give us a win, um, equipment malfunctions, all of those can be filled out in our reporting system. Uh, what do you guys get out of it? Well, when we review these cases, we try to get as much information as possible, and then we'll get feedback from experts we have here in our building. Um, we publish the incidents on our website, and so that way everybody can learn from your mishap without them actually knowing that it's you because we remove all um, identifying information from the report. Everyone can report, so not just the diver, anyone that witnesses the dive, um, anyone that happened to be on shore watching the, watching the divers come in, anybody can fill out this report if they've been involved or witnessed a dive incident. And to fill this report out, you can go to our website if you go under safety and prevention, report an incident, you can select this button here and it'll take you to this page. 
Now there is a little disclaimer. This is not a tool for you to file a claim on your membership. This is just a data analysis tool for us to get these reports in here at DAN. We do ask for your information so that we may contact you and follow up, maybe get some more information about what happened if your report is unclear. Um, but all of this is totally voluntary. And if you can't get to the website right now, you can scan this QR code and it should take you here. Now, when we publish your incident, we publish them under what's called Incident Insights. And it's based off of your DERS self-reported information. And again, we remove all identifying information so that it's completely anonymous and we just report on the facts. We do pass this information on to get feedback from um, experts and then we'll add their commentary to the report. Incidents that are reported may involve medical issues, mechanical issues, or training issues, you name it. And then I just wanna highlight here how exactly we review these cases. So we do these cases um, as they come in, so case-by-case -case analysis, and every case is handled a little bit differently, but it generally flows in this way. We have a case alert that we get when you fill out the survey, and then each case is reviewed by the injury monitoring team. We then try to get more information, so we might follow up with you or others involved if possible. And then once we compile all that information, we'll get feedback from different experts, different, maybe they're medical professionals, maybe they're dive professionals, and we'll publish the final comments and facts on the DAN website. And if you want to read along with those um, incident insights or view some, you can go to our website here. You can scan this QR code to make it easy. Um, and we have a, a bunch of different ones on the DAN website. Yeah, before you go on to the next slide, just like to jump in here with something that might be of interest to our audience tonight is that, you know, we've been continually updating the website and the functionality at the new dan.org. And one of the things we've added recently is the search function for these cases. So someone can go to that tab, the safety and prevention. They could search by a certain case type or what, what level of search uh, detail could you give yeah, us? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, on the right hand side of the page, we do have a search function. So if you're speaking with a student or a buddy of yours and you want to highlight a specific incident, you can type those keywords into the search bar and be able to find a bunch of different insights that pertain to that. And there's quite a few cases on there. There's right? quite a few okay. cases and there's some sitting in the bank too. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. So now we're going to get into some case analysis. Um, we have three cases, or three cases that have been published on our website and one case that is in our database but has not been published yet. Two of these cases are considered near misses or non-fatal accidents, and two of these cases did end up in fatalities. The first case is about um, buddy separation. As tonight, we're going to be highlighting situations where buddy um, best practices for you and your buddy uh, could have been essential in these incidents. So on a boat dive, a buddy team back rolls into the water and they make eye contact and give each other the okay signal. They discovered in, before they enter the water that there was a little bit of a current, so they wanted to make sure they enter the water together as to not drift apart. Once under, they made eye contact, gave the okay signal, and continued their ascent. And it was at about 30 feet that diver A looks back to find that their buddy is nowhere to be found. So diver A begins to swim back to the boat, making a steady incline towards the surface, looking for diver B, their buddy. Diver A then notices that diver B is hanging onto the back of the boat. At this point in time, diver A is actually underwater still at about 15 feet. And since they saw their buddy hanging on the back of the boat, they chose not to surface. Diver B was able to descend and they completed the dive together. Once back on the boat after completing the dive, Diver B explained that their regulator was breathing hard on their descent and decided to surface um, to figure out what was wrong. It turned out that the tank valve was screwed down to an almost closed position and they had not realized it before getting into the water. We really appreciate this diver sharing their story with us. This is something that has also happened to a buddy of mine at the beginning of the dive, and it's almost, it's, it's common, sadly. <laughs> so there are some takeaways here from the incident, and you can view those on our website. Uh, but first, this is a great example of why we should always stay close to our buddies on a dive. 
Diver B was correct to abort the dive to address this issue, but they were not able to get their buddy's attention to properly communicate that there was something wrong. Communication is another lesson that we'll continue to harp on tonight. Um, but there is something here in this incident that I would like to focus on, which is prevention. Had the diver done a proper buddy check, they would have been able to correct this issue before their splash and would have been able to continue the dive without interruption. Now, some of us have been divers for a long time. Um, we've seen standards and best practices change and change back over the years. So I've added this QR code to a recent Dan article we've published about the quarter turn back or the tank all the way open debate. Um, that's a hot button issue in the dive community right now. So take a minute and scan this QR code and just if you'd like to read more about that, we do have a lovely article that explains all of that. So the next case um, is also a buddy separation case uh, with a little bit of a twist. So Diver A reported this story to us and at some point in our diving careers, uh, you'll be asked to pair up with a diver that you've never been diving with before. Maybe you're traveling with family members that are too young to dive or you know, um, don't have any interest in diving. Maybe your regular buddy couldn't make it on the trip, they got sick, had to cancel, or just on the way out it was too choppy, they didn't feel like going on the dive. You tend to get paired up with another diver who's alone and doesn't have a buddy. Um, and sometimes that can be a little bit of a challenge. So in this case, Diver A was paired with a buddy they had never been diving with before, and as you can guess, the dive pair became separated, and Diver A found themselves away from the group entirely. It was reported that there was a very strong current, but the buddy pair were inside of each other about 50 feet apart for a portion of the descent. Diver A initially thought that they would see their buddy and the rest of the group once they reached the bottom, but that found themselves 96 feet down with no one around. They were able to make a controlled and slow ascent to the surface, call the boat over, and ultimately call the dive. It wasn't until the group was back a considerable amount of time later on the boat that Diver A and Diver B were reunited. And at this time, Diver B boarded the boat and explained that during the ascent, he thought that Diver A looked like he was in trouble and was going to surface. So Diver B chose to turn with the rest of the group and continue on the dive without confirming this or attempting to help. This case highlights a lot of issues we sometimes face as divers, namely the trust we have in our buddies, whether they are new to us or not. Sometimes this trust and the excitement of going on a dive allows us to miss important steps necessary to prepare for a dive. This also follows that communication theme we discussed a little bit earlier. So had the team discussed the dive plan and hand signals before the dive, there might not have been a miscommunication. It's also important to stay close with your buddy, as we mentioned in the case prior, so that if there is an emergency, you can rely on one another for assistance. Now for the sake of time tonight, I am only sticking with the main facts of each case. So there are some comments that I have had to leave out um, and this was a colorful self-reported incident. If you're interested in reading this insight in your spare time, you can scan this QR code um, and read it on our website. So Kat, before you go on to the next slide here, I'd just like to jump in for, for our audience. So you kind of talked about some things uh, that are important, like staying close to your buddy. So th those are things that are happening before there's an incident. Is there something or some advice you could give uh, tonight? What happens if you do get separated? Is there a best practice? What, what, what kind of protocol should a diver follow? Yeah, that's a great question. The standard if you get separated from your buddy is to look around for about one minute and then make your way to the surface and make a slow and controlled ascent. Um, and then hopefully you can reunite with your buddy on the surface. So that's typically what you should do if you get separated from your buddy. Do not continue the dive with the rest of your <laughs> okay. So the next two cases, uh, we'll discuss our stories where the diver was not as lucky and they do end in fatalities. Though somber and often difficult to talk about, it's important to highlight the facts of these cases so that our community may learn and implement safe practices. This scenario involves a, groups of, a group of divers that reportedly omitted their pre-dive checklist. Diver A was diving on a rebreather and was paired with another rebreather diver. 
It was reported that diver A did not want to stay on the surface long and the two had already planned to separate once they entered the water. Because of this, the only equipment check conducted was a quick bubble check on the initial descent. Both divers continued to descend on their own. It was later noted that diver A was last seen at the bottom, approximately 90 to 100 feet down, lying on the bottom and looking at something. When the diver did not surface as planned, the group became worried and began sending divers to look for him. U.S. Coast Guard was notified and lifeguard divers were dispatched to assist. After a six hour search, the diver was found at a depth of 92 feet at the same location he had descended. The diver was found lying on his back with the rebreather mouthpiece out of his mouth and closed. And the diver did not have a low pressure inflator hose connected to the dry suit inflation or BCD inflation valve. And the bailout regulator was no longer attached to his BCD harness. It appeared that he had attempted to use his bailout, but the regulator had an inline on off valve that was still in the off position. The investigation revealed that the diver placed the on off valve above the second stage to prevent the second stage from free flowing. And when tested, the valve was very hard to open. The gas in the cylinder was still unused. It was also revealed during the investigation that the diver was using 27 pounds of added weight on his rebreather rig, in addition to the negative buoyancy created by his bailout system and underwater camera equipment. Autopsy report revealed that the diver had water in both lungs and stomach consistent with drowning. We on the injury monitoring team chose to discuss this case to really shine a light on a growing industry problem, which is the omission of critical safety measures in a rush to complete a dive. Checklists are one of those critical safety measures, and in this case, omitting the pre-dive checklist cost this diver his life. This case also exemplifies the importance of speaking up and how few that happens in the dive community. Divers can pair off with others of varying skills and experiences, but the standards and best practices still apply. This includes calling each other out and looking out for one another. If you see a group member skip a step, say something so that they complete the dive as safe as possible, no matter how much experience that diver may have. Number four. In this case, a trio of divers were diving from shore looking for lobsters. It was reported to have been a cold water dive in, a ch in choppy conditions, about 44 degrees that day, but the area and the conditions were nothing new for this group. The three divers maintained visual contact throughout the dive, and on this dive, diver A was seen to have surfaced twice. Once after 34 minutes into the dive from a depth of 39 feet, then they descended again to a depth of 48 feet and stayed down for 26 minutes. The other divers noted that this was not unusual for Diver A to do, and Diver A had communicated to the team that it was just to reestablish their location. All three ended the dive together, and once at the surface, Diver A turned on his back, took his regulator out of the mouth, and began to surface swim back to shore. The other two divers chose to swim underwater due to the choppy condition. It's unclear if this was communicated to Diver A, and the two divers made it back to shore, began to take off their gear when they realized that diver A had not made it back yet. They turned to look out onto the water and saw fins sticking up out of the water. They rushed in and saw diver A face down and unresponsive. They were able to bring him to shore, begin CPR and activate EMS. The diver was transported to the hospital, but ultimately did not make it. As I mentioned before, Dan handles the reviews of fatal accidents um, differently than injuries or near misses. So for this case, we did request the autopsy report, but that request was denied. And the information provided in this case is mainly pr from the investigation report that local law enforcement provided for us. Based on this report, the manner of death was ruled to be drowning. Our team chose this case to review tonight to really drive home the importance of dive planning and communication with your buddy and all parties. Um, dive planning should include the entry and exit from the dive and all members of the dive team should end the dive and exit the water together. Communication is always necessary and key in staying alert and aware while on a dive. 
All four cases mark how important a buddy team planning and communication are when diving, and safe diving starts from dry land and ends on dry land. Plan your dive and dive your plan is a, is a common ideology in diving, but we are human and sometimes get comfortable in forgetting these sentiments. Planning your dive is not an individual endeavor. Planning and briefing should be done with your buddy and team and should include communication methods. Don't be afraid to ask each other clarifying questions so that the team is aware of what signals to use, when they will be diving, if there are any tasks involved, what they should expect to see, and when will the dive end and how they should enter and exit the water. Diving is a team sport, and in this sport, the win is making it back to shore safely. Some key considerations for tonight's injury monitoring update involve the essential steps of diving safety. This includes planning your dive, as we just discussed, completing your checklist with your buddy, briefing as a team on the dive plan, and debriefing as a team on the experience, what went well, where you got lucky, what you'd like to change before the next dive. Um, hey, let me just jump in here, yeah. another thing, and you've mentioned uh, the checklist uh, a couple times here, here tonight. Is there anything that would um, make up a good checklist? Like what, what should divers be looking for in that checklist? Yeah, Steve, that's a great question. So different agencies have different pseudonym or mnemonics for checklists, but essentially you want to be sure that you and your buddy are entering the water with everything that you need. You want to make sure you're properly weighted, that your gear is functioning properly, that your air is turned on. Um, there are some checklists that vary between recreational and technical um, and different tasks along the dive. You want to make sure your camera has lights and things like that. So you as an individual can create your own checklist, but it's important to relay that information to your buddy. What about people who are maybe traveling to a new place? You know, we've all been lo uh, locked down because of COVID for so long. We're anxious to get out there diving and traveling again. What about a diver who's going to somewhere that they've not been before? Does that checklist differ from a place that they visit frequently, a quarry, some place that's familiar to them? What, what is? The yeah, difference? yeah, absolutely. If you're traveling to somewhere new and the dive environment is new to you, definitely do your research before your dive. Make sure that you know exactly what type of exposure equipment you need, um, what you don't have to bring in case you bring too much gear. If you're like me and your stuff just lives in the back of your car, you go to the quarry and you're ready to jump in at any given time. But if I were to get on a plane um, to go down to the Keys or something like that, my whole setup and checklist looks completely different. And that's something that I'll work with the buddy I'm planning on traveling with and I'll do my research before I go down. Yeah, yeah. that's really good advice. Mm -hmm. Really know what you're getting into. Yeah. Some more key considerations that we have we also want you to note how important it is for the buddy to stay close to one another. I've said this several times tonight. I know you guys are kind of getting annoyed about it, but you need to stay close with one another. Okay, stay aware of each other and your surroundings, aware of the group that you're diving with, um, aware of the conditions, and stay alert to any abnormal conditions or occurrences. Communicate with each other early and often, and take note of other buddy teams in your group so that you can maintain awareness and be able to assist if needed. And for any dive pros uh, that are tuning in, it's important that we remember to lead by example. We as pros should always exemplify safe diving practices. And if you are the more experienced diver in the team, set a good example for your buddy. Speak up if you see something missing um, and be a reliable resource should there be any emergency or incident. You can see how much goes into reviewing these cases. I just covered four and it took up a little bit of time tonight, uh, but those four are not unique. I even mentioned a couple that have happened to be. <laughs> They're also not the only ones that have happened in diving. So we need your help to report on these cases. Um, it's important for you guys to report it to us so that we can see any trends and deviations within our community in these cases. Again, your reporting is confidential, so it's not going to have any bearings on your membership or your credentials, your certifications, or anything like that. Um, it's simply a tool for us to gather information and learn from one another. So if you see something, please say something so that our community can learn grow and stay safe.
Great, Kat. Th thanks for the uh, the presentation. It was very informative, and I hope the uh, the audience le learned something tonight. And I'd just like to take this opportunity to open up for questions, and we'll give it a minute or two because sometimes it takes uh, the internet uh, a second to populate the questions. But um, what I mean, if you had to re recap tonight's talk in just a, a couple couple short thoughts, I mean, what, what would your key takeaways be from your presentation? Right. We definitely highlighted cases where a buddy in that situation could have assisted um, the two separation case cases and then miscommunications that happened along the dive, omitting a pre-dive checklist. These are all things that happen far too often. Um, and I can even honestly say that I've been guilty of a couple. Um, so we need to start as a community communicating with each other so we can make changes and not so many cases come across our desk here at Dan. Um, I'd really like everybody to remember that this is in no way a, a blame game or you know pointing fingers at anybody. Mistakes happen, we're all human, uh, but we need to keep in mind what best practices are and just remember that every time you dive, you're not alone. Somebody can help you. You don't have to face any issues or mechanical issues or struggles by yourself. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And obviously, when you talk about Dan, we're always here 24-7, whether it's the emergency hotline, uh, our research team, although they're not on, on call 24-7, uh, right. probably, uh, <laughs> thankfully, for, for Kat and her, her staff. But you can always reach them at, at research at dan.org. You can send them your questions. If you're looking for information, you need help, you need guidance, they're there. That That's what we're here for. So um, I'm not seeing any questions come in through the chat here tonight. Um, so we'll, yeah. uh, we'll move to, to wrap up the presentation, but I'd just like to say uh, thank you for joining us tonight on behalf of uh, Dan and all the staff here, the research medical uh, teams, risk mitigation. It's really uh, with your support that we're able to put on presentations like this to keep you safer and better prepared. Uh, prepared. So uh, with that, we'll leave you with that and uh, have a good night and safe diving, everyone.